I said, hallelujah. Let all my worship flow to you. <laughs> hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. For he is greatly to be praised. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Father. Let all my worship. Mm. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. So we bless you this morning, Father. It is our desire, dear God, to create an atmosphere that is conducive for you to move among us. And so, Father, this morning as we come, we come as humbly as we know how. We come reverencing you. Father, we thank you for this setting. We are prepared and we are ready to be ministered to by you. Now I pray, Father, that you would think through my mind, that you would speak through my vocal cords, that it be all of you and none of me. I invite, I welcome your peace, your power, and your presence, all of which we need in this hour. It's in Jesus' name we pray. And everybody said, Amen. Hallelujah. Well, this is another day that he has made. We may as well go ahead and rejoice. I said we may, may as well go ahead and rejoice. Yeah, but I don't feel like it. You may as well go ahead on and rejoice <laughs> and be glad in it. Amen. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Well, I praise God for you that are here. I praise God for those who are now viewing us via Facebook, YouTube, or from our website. We want to say welcome. This morning, it is my intent to finish this series that I've been on now. Actually, this is the fifth week. And um, so that we can move on to some other things, amen? All right, so let's take our Bibles and hold them up so that we can release our faith this morning into and over the Word of God. This is my Bible. I am what it says I am. I can have what it says I can have. I can do what it says I can do. I will be taught the word. My mind will be alert. My spirit will be receptive. And I'm expecting. I am expecting. My life from this day forth to never be the same. Shall never, never, never be the same in Jesus' name. Amen, amen, amen. That we never be the same. Thank you, Lord. 
as I was saying, this today will be our fifth teaching in the series of recognizing the season and time of life. And my intent from its inception uh, when I first started teaching this was to use this series. In fact, all that I teach is to encourage the body. That whatever area that you are in, whatever situation you are dealing with, that you can receive the encouragement I believe that God wants you to have. And not only the encouragement, but that you will receive something that you can take away and that you can appropriate and you can apply to your life. Because I believe, as the scripture says, that we want to be doers of the word and not just hearers only. Amen. God's design is that his word, as it is preached or taught, that it profit us, that we benefit from his word. Amen. And so uh, I believe I have the witness of it in my spirit that uh, many of you are being in, have been rather encouraged and um, on today you will be even the more, I believe, encouraged. In the book of Ecclesiastes, Chapter number three, Ecclesiastes chapter number three, verse number one from the King James translation. To everything there is a season. How many things? Everything. To everything there's a season and a time to every purpose. Where? Under heaven. Amen. So we see that, in fact, I, I was just before I came out, I noticed something here. Notice it says two. So we understand, or we should understand, that the seasons that's referred to here is something that God ordained. Amen. But then it said to, to. In other words, he attached to everything, everything that you and I face, deal with, everything. If it's a thing, it has a season. Amen. And a time to every purpose under heaven. And so we've been talking again, as I said, for, from the subject of recognizing the season and time of life. Or another way you can say it, which referring to the same thing, and that is identifying identifying the season. Now, what do you mean identifying the season? Well, we need to know the season of time that we're in. We all are in different seasons. Now, naturally speaking, we all experience, at least in this part of the world, we all experience summer together. Amen? We all experience, uh, for the most part, I'll put it that way. But when we talk uh, spiritually, then we all are dealing, or we all are in different places. Amen. Concerning season. You are in a season. Amen. Now, I mean, you may not, and I don't believe anyone here um, would say, you know, that, or uh, argue that point, but you are in a season. We are in a season. I'm in a season, you're in a season. Now, but notice the title 
and that is identifying, recognizing the season that I'm in. So let me ask this question. Why, why, why do you think it's important that we recognize or we identify the season that we're in? What's the big deal? I mean, you know, I understand, okay, I can accept the fact that I'm in a season, but why is it important that I identify or recognize the season that I'm in? Well, first of all, you know, you, you we want to know whatever, see, because whatever season we're in, you know, we, we want God to walk through this thing with us. Amen. And what God wants us to do is to know how to apply his word to whatever situation that we find ourselves in. Amen. <laughs> and then not only that, we don't want to be dabbing into something, you know, when we can give our attention to what's at hand, the real thing. You know, it's kind of like the Bible tells us, thank you for that, Holy Ghost, that we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers, against the wicked spirits in high places. <coughs> well, I don't want to be, you know, wrestling and, and dealing with flesh and blood when I need to be dealing with the spirits in high places and, and so forth. Amen. And so, you know, if God is going to walk through this thing with us, well, he's going to be with us, but I'm talking about where we're being led, where his spirit is ministering to us, you know, navigating us through and out of uh, the season that we're in, then we need to know, we need to be able to identify what season we're in so we can apply the right word, amen, so we can do the right things, amen, in the season that we find ourselves now, <coughs> season, what, what is a season? A season is an appointed occasion. It's an appointed occasion. Now, of course, as you read on down, it says a time to, to be born and a time to die and a time to cast away and a time, uh, you know, to, to gather. And when we see these different times. In fact, let's look down at verse number 11. Verse 11 says, He that is God have made how many things? Everything beautiful. See, so when we're dealing with God, number one, it always have a redemptive purpose. When we're dealing with God, you know, God is always <coughs> working to grow us up, to mature us, amen, and it's unfortunate, you know, for many of us that we have to deal with, you know, different situations and have different struggles and things in our lives, not the, f not the fact that God create or God bring these things, amen. We all know that we live in a fallen world, amen, and, uh, and so, th uh, you know, good things happen, I mean, excuse me, bad things happen to good people, amen, and so... <coughs> You know, the storms of life come to us all. Amen. And there are different storms. Though the storms of life come to us all, we don't have to, amen, succumb to these storms. I believe God wants us to know how to weather these storms. Amen. Hallelujah. Um, so, notice it said season. Season. Now, other translation says a fixed time, a fixed time, an appointed time, an opportune time, a special time. See, we, we, you know, we don't want to, in fact, I don't know how true this is, but I, I read this, uh, and that is, you know, we can't, well, I know for sure we can't pick and choose the season that we want to be in. But here's where I'm, I, I question, and I'm not really sure, and I'm, I'm quoting someone, and it could be some truth to it, and that is we, we can't slow up the season in terms of 
you know, if we know it's coming and then we want it to hold up, and you know, and no, we can't slow it up. But we can prolong the season. I said we can prolong the season. You know, I mean, you know, we know that from a natural standpoint, seasons last, you know, uh, a certain amount of time, naturally speaking. And yet, spiritually speaking, you know, a, uh, a season for us, whatever season we're in, uh, could last quite some time. Amen. But isn't it comforting to know that whatever season I'm in, God is in it with me? Amen. And, uh, and so what I'm going to be talking to you today about, <coughs> well, uh, let, me, let me work my way into this. As Christians, we face different seasons at different times in life. Each season brings with it different, watch this, characteristics. Each season, whatever season you're in, there are characteristics. Amen. So each season brings with it different characteristics. Yet when we face them with the redemptive hand of God in sight, we can learn as we grow stronger in our faith no matter what season we find ourselves in. One of the seasons we will face as believers in Christ, I call this a dry season. A dry season. And the first thing that I want you to notice as I move into this dry season, the first thing I want you to notice is that a dry season will stretch our faith to the max. It will stretch your faith. Amen. You're talking about a stretch in your faith, a dry season will do just that. Stretch your faith. Just like summer brings in a certain dryness and makes uh, make our, uh, us feel tired, famished, and dehydrated, while many consider entering this season as God's will, there are times when entering such a season is because, watch this, we stepped into it. In other words, there are things that I believe that we can do, and as a result of that, that catapult us into different seasons, if you understand what I'm saying. Now, the great evangelist D.L. Moody understood this. When asked why he placed so much emphasis upon being filled with the Holy Spirit, watch this, <laughs> he wisely said, listen at me now, because I leak, L-E-A-K, because I leak, you'll get it. Because that was one of the things that he was noted for. D.L. Moody was noted for emphasizing being filled with the Spirit. He always talked about the Holy Spirit and being filled with the Spirit. And so he wisely said, because I leak. <laughs> so consider Job, who felt God had deserted him and left him for dead. What about Joseph? When he spent years in jail, in a jail cell, probably wondering when God's promise uh, for him, based on the dream that he had, would be revealed or come to his fruition. So we have good company in terms of people that have experienced dry seasons in their life. Dry seasons are not comfortable. In fact, most of the seasons are not, but dry season definitely is not. Now, uh, I've dealt with a, a waiting season, and I'm dealing now with a dry season. And I'm dealing with these two in particular because I feel like everyone, everyone experienced a dry season or a waiting season. Amen. 
Now, of course, you know, in the season, if we're not careful, I believe that we can do things, you know, that will set us back. We can do things that will hurt us. And see, that's what the enemy is purposing uh, that we do. That's why it's so important that we identify and we recognize where we are so that we can begin to navigate, amen, um, and, and allow the Spirit of God, you know, to walk us through whatever season that we are in. Amen? All right. So turn, if you will, to Psalms 61 and 1. Psalms 61 and 1. You know, we all have, I'm sure, <sighs> I said 61, didn't I? 63, excuse me. 63. You know, we all have experienced the presence of God. In fact, just, you know, uh, flow through me, let my worship flow through me. You know, just being in the presence of God, worshiping him in spirit and in truth. You know, we all can sense the presence of God. Hallelujah. But what about those times when you don't sense the presence of God? You know, and you know, listen, you know that he's with you. Now, you know, and not to get caught up in this trap about feeling but you don't sense God is with you. You don't sense the presence of God. Wh what do we do during those times? Remember I said from the onset is that this dry season will stretch your faith like nothing else. It will stretch your faith. What do you do in times when you don't sense the presence of God? You don't sense God speaking to you. And you don't sense he hearing you. You know, I, you don't sense, you know, that, 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 that God, that you have God's attention. And yet you know what the word of God says. And the Holy Spirit keeps dragging you back to what does the word say. And but yet what we do, we find ourselves right back, you know, in that place of not sensing the presence of God. And one of the things that I believe that we must, we have to be careful about is, and that is because this is where the enemy can come in at. The first thing come to most people's mind is, what have I done wrong, God? Where have I missed the mark? Where have I missed you at? And that may or may not be the case. Oh, you hear what I'm saying? But you don't sense the presence of God. Well, we know that that's one of the reasons why we have faith. Whether I see it, whether I can feel it, whether it look like it, because the word says it's so, then it is so. Amen. David was such a person that experienced dry season. Psalm 63 verse 1 says, O God, thou art my God. Early will I seek thee. My soul thirsted for thee. My flesh longeth for thee. In a dry and thirsty land where there is no water. As I said to you, that a dry season will stretch your faith like nothing else. But a dry season should push us more into the presence of God. Causing us to seek the face of God. Causing us to seek God like we never have seeked him before. I know for myself, in that season, I felt like just shutting down. 
You know, and anything that we experience that's contrary to the word, know this, it's the devil. That he's attempting to drive us or to draw us into areas that we don't want to be in. My soul thirsted for thee. In a place where there seems to be. And see, all of this has to do, it doesn't seem like. <laughs> Watch this. So here are some signs or characteristics that we are becoming spiritually depleted. If we can relate to these, you need to reconnect with God and receive a fresh infilling of his spirit. Number one, giving while empty or weary. Giving, now I'm not talking about giving money, but I'm talking about giving of yourself where your service is concerned. Giving while empty or weary. A sign of spiritual dryness is one when a person no longer is giving to others out of a sense of fulfillment. They're no longer what they are doing, they're, not, they're no longer doing it out of a sense of fulfillment. They don't realize that they are becoming empty. They're coming to a place of being depleted. <laughs> they feel empty or weary. Their inner tank is running dry. You know, I read a book one time uh, by, what this guy's name is, um, uh, uh, Cadero. Uh, I know his last name is Cadero. And, and the subject of the book was leading on empty. Leading on empty. In other words, trying to lead people or lead a congregation and you're empty. And he talked about his experience in doing so, in his attempt to try to lead people. And he also talked about for so long in his life, during that, that time, that season of dryness, for so long, you know, he winged it. If you understand what I mean when I say winged it. He was just going through the motions. And to some people it appeared that everything was fine. But what it ended up doing was, listen, it ended up causing him physical, he, he, he ex started experiencing some physical issues in his body. He started taking pills and doing all these kind of, you know, natural things. He went to see a psychiatrist and so forth and so on. But the thing that brought him through that season was, and, and this was a shock to me, he mentioned how <laughs> he went and he went to a monk m monastery, and of course he didn't side in with them, but it was a place of quietness where he took no cell phone, no iPad, where it was just him and God. And he began to spend quality time with God. A dry season. <laughs> if left unattended, spiritual dryness can impact one's emotion, emotional, can impact one emotionally, mentally, and even physically. See, I believe that that's one of the things that Satan is, would love to drive us to, to where it affects us spiritually, I mean, excuse me, uh, physically. We know God is not making folks sick. But I believe that because we're not handling, we're not navigating through this as the Lord would have us to, it lead or can lead to something physical, physically happening in our bodies. Amen. So we don't want to do anything on empty. It's important that we, we, stay, we stay filled up. 
You know, that's the importance of constantly hearing the word. You know, many don't realize this, but how hearing the word of God really keeps you full. In fact, that's what you are able to do whatever you do out of is because of what's in you. But when there's nothing in you, you know what that leads to? It leads to burnout. It leads to burnout. And many people, unfortunately, during this time, you know, they uh, depart from the faith. You know why? Mainly because, listen, they don't understand what's going on. And so they get involved in different things that they shouldn't get involved in. And things began to compound upon, you know, you know, to begin to compound itself from one thing to another and one thing to another that eventually leads them away from Christ. Now, I'm not talking about in a week's time, but that's the ultimate goal of Satan. But yet it's the ultimate goal of God is that there, you know, I talked to you, talk rather about redeeming uh, his redemptive purpose is that we grow in our faith, that we, we learn to trust him more, you know, that our faith is deepened, that we are strengthened, amen, that the joy of the Lord is our strength. These are things that God wants to come out of whatever season you're in, and certainly this dry season. <laughs> Number two, a s a s um, we're talking about a dry season, serving out of duty. Serving out of duty is no longer out of passion. It has turned to a duty. When someone is spiritually dry, there is a subtle shift in their motivation to serve God. Whether in the church or elsewhere, they are no longer motivated by passion. And passion, thank God, will motivate us. Passion will keep us going. Hallelujah. They feel an inner reluctance to resistance to serve, but continue to do so because they feel they no longer have a choice. Watch this. They feel trapped. See, I'm telling you, people, it's in this place that people can do some dumb things. Play right into the hands of the enemy. When a person feels trapped, it's kind of like, I hear people refer to an animal, you know, when you back him up against the wall and, you know, he don't have nothing else to, you know, nowhere else to go. And he, he, he comes out, I mean, it's like he's a wild person. Because he's going kicked into survival mode. <laughs> <laughs> Hallelujah. You feel trapped. Their motivation, li listen, their motivation to continue serving may be that others are relying on them. And that can hold you up for a while, I say, for a while. Or they want to honor a commitment they have made. People, because they, you know, because they are a person of character and, and integrity, they made a commitment and they want to honor that. Amen. But see, someone at some point or another should be able to see through that, you know, and talk to that person, amen, and give them the liberty to relieve them for a time. Or they feel a duty towards God or towards his calling on their life. And so they make the attempt to stick and stay. But yet they're only serving out of duty. That there is, there is no passion, there is no zeal to do what they're doing anymore. Number three, their faith is no longer contagious. Another word for contagious would be infectious. Their faith is no longer contagious. 
according to the psalmist David, noted, turn to, let's look at this, Psalms 51, Psalms 51, their faith is no longer contagious. When you're in a dry season, one of the things that happens, you don't want to talk to nobody about the Lord. Really, you feel like you need somebody to talk to you about the Lord. <laughs> but have you ever been in the company of people where their faith is just contagious. I mean, they're just excited about God, about the things of God. But now we're talking about in a dry season. One of the characteristics of being in a dry season is their faith is no longer, for this season, contagious, contagious or infectious. Psalms 51 Notice verse number three. Now, we know fifth Psalm 51 is David where he repented and where he, you know, because of, you know, his sin and what he had done, you know, where Bathsheba was concerned. But notice verse three. David said, for I acknowledge my transgression and my sin is ever before me. Now, let me say this. Sin. See, we all miss the mark. Amen. But God has made provisions in his word, amen, for us to repent, amen, for us to, you know, to repent. And uh, 1 John 1, 9, you know, says we confess our sins. He is faithful and just to forgive us, amen, and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. But now notice here, verse 4 says, against thee and thee only. Now, I find that very interesting because one of the things that David did was he had this woman's husband killed, first of all. But he didn't say, I sinned against, uh, who was, was it, what's the, uh, uh, no, what was uh, Bathsheba's husband, who was it, her husband? Uriah. Notice he said, against thee and thee only have I sinned and done this evil in thy sight. That thou mightest just that thou might be justified when thou speakest, and be clear when thou judgest. Drop down, if you will, to verse number eleven. Cast me not away from thy presence. So David understood, and David knew of all people the importance of the presence of God. And yet in his mind's eye, it's obvious here. Notice he said, don't cast me away from your presence. And take not thy spirit, thy Holy Spirit, from me. Now verse 12 says, restore. Restore unto me the joy of thy salvation. Uphold me with thy free spirit. The amplifier said, restore to me the joy of your salvation and uphold me with a willing spirit. Restore. So joy now, joy because of this particular incident, he felt like joy was no longer present. So David said to God, restore unto me the joy of my salvation. Salvation and joy is a package deal. Amen. Thank God for joy. I remember Jerry Seville had a book one time. Um, I, I didn't read it. I just the, the saying that if the devil can't steal your joy, he can't keep your goods. Amen. So if you lose your joy, if you no longer sense the joy, amen, 
And so we are tempted in this area when we get into this season, we fall into this season, this dry season of feeling like we have no joy. Wow. When we are spiritually dry, it affects our relationship with those who don't know Christ. When we are not bubbling over, we have lost our joy. People are not seeing something in us that caused them to thirst for God. And we lack the motivation to share with them feelings we have nothing to offer. When we share, when we have opportunity, and it could, it could not be where we initiated, it could be others that initiated. They are thirsty. They're not, I mean, of course, they're not saying that, but just wanting to talk to you or wanting to talk to someone. I had a lady on the job the other day. You know, she wanted to talk to me because she was about to make a decision, uh, uh, you know, about doing some things. And she mentioned to me, you know, she said, you know, uh, Mr. O, I need to talk to you. And so that gave me an opportunity to share with her. Evidently, she saw something. Amen. And not only that, but here's what I, one of the things that I told her, and I said this. I said, the fact that you did not lean to your own understanding, but you were willing to talk to someone because you wanted to know the heart of God concerning this issue. Well, what happened if you all tore up? What happened if you all messed up? Number four. It appears or is seen that God is distant. Let's look at something here. L turn, if you will, to Psalms. Psalms 10 and 1. Psalms and one. Look at this. Why stand thou thy afar off, O Lord? Why hide thyself in the time of trouble? Why, why are you hiding yourself in my time of trouble? Why, why, why are you standing far off? There are times that it seems God is distant. Now we know, I'm telling you, people of God, we know better. I'm talking about folk that are seasoned, mature, know that God said, I'll never leave you, nor will I forsake you. But yet we entertain the thought that God has distanced himself from us. Let's see this in the Amplified Translation. Why do you stand afar off, O Lord? Why do you hide yourself? Veiling your eyes in times of trouble, distress, and desperation. Psalms 13, 1 and 2. Psalms 13, 1 and 2. And these are just a few of the verses. Because there are countless verses, you know, in here, especially where David is concerned. <coughs> Psalms 13. How long will thou forget me, O Lord? God ain't forgot you. We know he hadn't forgot. But how long, because it seems this way, how long have thou forgotten me? How long, rather, will thou uh, forget me, rather, O Lord? Forever? How long will thou hide thy face from me? Now, we know God is not playing hide and seek with us. But I'm telling you, see, your faith during a dry season will be stretched to the max. Because when you come in contact with things that are being said, you can apply. You know God is not hiding his face from you, but it seems like it. And it becomes more real during the dry season in your life. Psalms 22 and 12. Psalms 22 and 12. There are times it seems like God has distant himself from us. Let's 
excuse me, 42 and 11. 42 and 11. I'm sorry. 42 and 11. Why art thou cast down, O my soul? Why art thou disqui disquieted within me? Hope thou in God, for I shall yet praise him. I shall yet praise him. I don't feel like it. Don't really want to. But I know that it's good for me. So here we see something you know, being told to us concerning being in those dry seasons, and that is even though you don't feel like, see, one of the things we can't do, you cannot in a dry season go with how you feel. Because I don't even have time to go through the things that you will experience if you went through what you feel, the way you felt. And why art thou disquieted within me? Hope thou in God, for I shall yet praise him, who is the health of my countenance and my God, for I shall yet praise him. That's a time, listen, child of God, when you, listen, when you're in your dry season, you want to seize every opportunity you have to quieten yourself, to get before God and allow the Spirit of God, allow the Spirit of God to minister to you. And don't forget to praise him. Amen. Because what praise does is it circumvent. It goes around how we feel. And God knows, the spirit of God knows now you've entered into a place of faith because you didn't feel like it. <laughs> All right. Hallelujah. When we are spiritually dry, there can be a gradual distance distancing from God. Either we are not encountering him regularly as we are accustomed to, or we are not hearing from him, or we are not hearing him speak to us intimately. In other words, we are not hearing God. The things that we have grown accustomed to with God, those things are no longer to seem like. And I believe a lot of it has to do with you and I being sensitive to God more sensitive to him than we are the situation that we're in. And I'm telling you something, child of God, if, if you, uh, if you when going back to stretching your faith, you will find yourself in the dry season doing uh, countless things and don't have no feeling. Because there are times I feel like getting in the Word. Come on, let's be real. I feel like praying. But now let's talk about the time when you don't feel like praying. You don't feel like getting in the word. Hallelujah. There's, devotion, there's devotional life connected to God through the Bible, and prayer has either been reduced to a, uh, just an exercise or, it's a, or an occasion. See, we can become so mechanical in different things that we do and yet, when it comes to a place where you're in that dry season and those things are no, mo no longer mechanical and you try to work up certain feelings, you try to manufacture certain things. No, child of God, this is the season that we have to be very careful in. Let me fast forward. Number six and the last one, the final. Negative Excuse me? Oh, I skipped five. Oh, well, let's, let's, no, five, okay. It seems your spiritual life is in a rut. You feel like your spiritual life is in a rut. You lack the excitement that you once had in your relationship with God. Y you lack the excitement the exuberance that you had with God. Number six, negative thinking. The thing about negative thinking is the fact that if there's negative thinking, if you're not careful, it will be negative words. 
not, not all the time, and certainly if you are aware, you know, that that was a negative thought. But negative thinking can lead to negative words. And you know one of the things that the Bible, I believe it's uh, Proverbs 6, 2 says, thou art snared by the words of your mouth. Thou art held captive by the words of your mouth. The power of life and death is in the tongue. You remember I talked about how we can, we can prolong a season? That's one sure way of prolonging a season. Now, as we began to come out of one season, watch this, God is preparing us for the next season. No, he will prepare us for the next season that we will be going into, because you will go into another season. Now, it doesn't all, listen, child of God, I'm not talking about all the season has to be that, you know, this intense, but I, I do believe that there is something that God desires to bring out of us, develop in us, s you know, through these, or uh, in these seasons. And one sure way for us to develop and to grow and to mature is the resistance that we meet in these seasons. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Now, negative thinking. The kingdom of God is righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Ghost. Romans 4, 17. When we are spiritually dry, the atmosphere of heaven, righteousness, peace, and a joy seems to in invade, uh, to evade rather, us, to escape us. Instead, we find it easier to give way to negative thinking. We falter in our ability to resist and to cast down imaginations and every high thing that would exalt itself against the knowledge of God, bringing into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. Talking about that dry season. So these are the areas that when we're in a dry season, now, I, you know, these are some characteristics, and I don't believe these are all, but these are some characteristics, and the reason why I can you know, um, share with you, you know, concerning the things, a lot of what I've shared with you is because I know, been there, done that, Th threw away the t-shirt. <laughs> Don't want no remembrance. <laughs> Amen. A dry season. But yet we need to understand that these things, it may seem like God is distant. It may seem like you've lost your joy. And in essence, you really haven't. Amen? All right. Well, my time is up. Thank you for yours. Hallelujah. Father, we're so grateful and ever thankful to you. for your word. We thank you, Father, today that in whatever season we find ourselves for the assurance of knowing that you are in that season with us. We know that your desire is to grow us up, develop us, enable us to become more Christ-like. And much of this cannot take place without resistance. We understand that it's just a fact of life. We live in a fallen world. And good thing, bad things rather happen to good people. But I thank you, Father, your word says, thanks be unto God who always causes us to triumph. And for that, we thank you and we give you praise. In Jesus' name, amen.
and amen. Every head, body, every eye closed. If you're here today or if you are viewing me via Facebook, YouTube, whatever platform, if you've been listening to me share and minister, the Bible said that faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word. If you're in a place where you do not know Jesus Christ today as your Lord and Savior, I implore you, I appeal to you to make Jesus Christ the Lord of your life. There are things that God, no doubt, wants to do with your life and in your life. But it can only happen through your submission and through your willingness to make him Lord of your life. And so if you want to know Jesus Christ today as your personal Savior and Lord, I want to pray with you. I want to lead you into a very powerful confession of faith. Are you ready? All right. Here we go. Dear God, I'm asking you now to come into my life. I now confess Jesus as Lord over my life. I thank you for forgiving me of all of my sin. And right now, I make Jesus Christ Savior and Lord over my life. Amen. If you meant that prayer, amen, you're born again. I said you were born again. Welcome to the family. But there's another experience that I don't want to leave without give you an opportunity. And that is to be filled with the Spirit or be filled with the Holy Spirit. You need to be filled with the Holy Spirit. It doesn't mean that you're going to go to heaven or you get any brownie points with God, but the Holy Spirit will help you live the life that God would have for you to live. So, again, would you confess after me? Dear God, I'm asking you now to fill me with your Spirit. Holy Spirit, Come into my life. Fill me with overflowing, with your power, with your might, and with your ability. Help me from this day forward to live for and to serve God as best as I know how. Thank you, Father, for filling me with your spirit. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. All right, well, if you meant what you confess, that is receiving the infilling of the Holy Spirit, I want to encourage you uh, to go and visit our website, nloc-outreach.com, access the tab, now what? <coughs> and there you'll find... Um, some things that will greatly uh, encourage you in your new life or in your walk with Christ. Amen. Please don't forget that. NLOC-outreach.com. Access the tab. Now what? Amen. And you'll find some vital information there for you. Amen. Well, before I close out the service today, I want to also give you an opportunity to give or to sow into Newness of Life. Newness of Life is supported by you, the listeners, and the free will offerings of you, the viewers, and listeners, um, and through the tithes and the offering. Now, concerning the tithe, if you are part of another 
congregation, you have a commitment there, that's where your tithe belongs. But if you're not connected with a local church, then you're free uh, to tithe to newness of life. Whatever the Lord will say for you to do concerning your finances, do it. That is one sure way of involving God in on your finances. And when I say involving God, I mean if there's a shortage, if there's a lack, then God will get involved. But first and foremost, you have to be obedient to the word. Amen? Thank you in advance for your giving and your sowing into newness of life. And remember, you can walk in a new quality of life.